having me on. This is really exciting to collaborate in this way and talk about a topic that I find to be so near and dear to my heart, uh, both as a physician and um, a parent and someone that tend to, used to get sick all the time. So, um, you know, I think that holistic knowledge is always very powerful and transformative, but its importance has reached new heights because of what just happened with COVID-19. So with the fall, fast, well, we're deeply in fall now, and so many of our communities are reopening. I think we need to protect and boost our families' immune systems now more than ever, and of course our own. Um, I think that boosting your immune system preventatively makes the difference between having a mild illness with no symptoms, whether it be any viral or bacterial illness, or severe illness and hospitalization. And as I'm talking to you now, I'm actually in a hospital setting, so I know both worlds really well. Um, now, because I'm a holistic and conventional pediatrician, I follow really strict criteria when I make these recommendations. And so the recommendations that I have for you on how to boost your children's and, uh, immune system also applies to adults. And it has the really, really um, important criteria that I wanna to mention to you. So the criteria that I'm using when I make recommendations are one, the solution doesn't cover up symptoms. It's not a band-aid solution. What that means is it addresses the root cause of whether an illness or, or um, a physi physiological state. That is basically the difference between holistic, what do we consider holistic pediatrics and conventional pediatrics. And I think that this is extremely fundamental to understand for true health for all, for adults and children. Um, the second criteria that I use when I make recommendations is that it needs to support the body's natural healing process, meaning it helps the body heal itself and not, not just gives you, not just giving you kind of, um, uh, what, uh, what might cover up symptoms. The third criteria is that it does not cause harm. This is actually really specific to pediatrics because a lot of things are not tested on children. And so there might be recommendations that are very appropriate for adults, but they might not be appropriate or safe or tested for children. And what this means is it has to be free of chemicals or preservatives as well. Um, the fourth recommendation, the fourth criteria that I use to make recommendations is that it is made mindfully. Um, and that means that there is, there is the process of from farmer to the soil to even the impact on our environment has to be considered when we as practitioners or I as a practitioner make recommendations. And the fifth criteria that I'm using to make recommendations comes from my conventional medicine background, which is that it's evidence-based. That usually means that it's subject to really excellent, double-blind, placebo-controlled, top-notch studies of all the ingredients that are in the recommendations. So with that in mind, I'd like to offer my first recommendation to boosting your uh, child's immune system, especially when it comes to the fall season. And oh, really always, the first recommendation is we want to help connect the mind the heart and the immune system. What do I mean by that? Well, there, there are so many ways to affect the immune system, both positive and negative ways. We all know that. And there's a tremendous amount of knowledge and evidence-based information on what foods and, and herbs and homeopathic formulations can boost the immune system. But what about mindset? Only recently, conventional medical communities started to focus on how, how mindset can affect immunity. And I think that's excellent because we are seeing more and more the need for uh, a natural holistic approach to merge with conventional medicine. Why? Because it works and we need it as a society. And so with that in mind, there are so many amazing studies coming out um, about how mindset and heart set affects your immune system. Affect and emotion are two essential parts of the process of a, an, or any organism's interaction with a stimuli. So an immune response is a tool the body uses to interact with external environment. There is a large body of evidence, both clinical and experimental, that shows that the immune systems and the emotional system literally mirror each other. They're both dynamic, they form a symbiotic relationship, they're continuously changing, and they're always adjusting. 
So unlike, um, let's say, genetic mutations or something that you inherit, like an inherited predisposition to, to a disease that cannot really be changed on the genetic plane, this mind-body medicine can literally normalize the immune system, reduce overactive inflammation, improve sleep quality, and increase cellular resist resiliency. And this is what we need now in the fall more than ever as we go into colder flu season. There are so many amazing mindfulness tools for all ages. They're available so easily now. I mean, we have yoga and meditation that are made for children. There are creative expressions like art, song, and dance, uh, journaling, uh, gratitude, visualizations. There's really no limitation of resources that we can use for not only ourselves, but for our children. And adopting a mindfulness moment, just even just for a few minutes with your child, even the youngest, is a vital tool for boosting your child's immune system and superpowering their health. One of my favorite um, ways to kind of connect the mind, body, and heart with my child is to, like, when, once we come home from school or after studying a ton, I would just have her take a really deep, big breath. Not only does that bring a fresh supply of oxygen to all of ourselves, making them more resilient than ever, but it calms us down and it connects the mind, the body, and ultimately impacts and mirrors to the immune system. The second recommendation is an oldie, but goodie, and I'm sure you've heard it before, of it before, it's vitamin C. I consider that a holistic approach to boosting immunity because it could be done preventatively and it's pretty natural. It's so important for immune health and antioxidant protection. It's also really essential for collagen and connective tissue production. And a lot of that is in our guts, and we'll talk about gut health in a few minutes, but this is why I recommend most kids who are prone to getting sick, who have um, predisposing medical conditions, um, or are in an environment where they tend to get sick a lot, I literally put them on vitamin C through food, but also through supplementation, um, all through fall and winter seasons. One of my favorite ways to, um, to you take vitamin C is a liposomal form of vitamin C. It, it literally absorbs through the fat, and it can be uh, taken in in the mouth um, it's like a, a little bit of a solution it tastes good and it's easy to give we always always want to make sure that when we um, when we get recommend something for children they're actually taking it so this is a big recommendation there's a lot of evidence behind vitamin C and how it can protect us from viruses and bacteria especially through the fall season my next recommendation is to help support the detox body, the body's detox process. This, um, this could be done many different ways. My favorite way is juicing. And I think that this is a long lost art and I'd like to bring it back. So we all know that we cannot sit down and eat a whole pound of carrots in one sitting. I mean, who really wants to do that? But all these nutrients can be consumed in one cup of freshly juiced, freshly juiced carrot juice. When we, of course, fiber from all fruits and vegetables is so important. It helps a stool and that does help with detox. But in order to get a really solid, really fast, a really powerful boost into our bodies, drinking fresh juice on an empty stomach does the trick. It helps the body detox. It supports glutathione um, uh, 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 function in the body. So my favorite combos are carrot, apple, celery, and beetroot. Any colorful vegetable will do. Any colorful fruit will do. Uh, we want to be careful that we don't use all fruits. And so my rule is to kind of do 50% tasty, which is fruit, and 50% less tasty, although I think that it's really tasty to drink green juice. Uh, and so those are your veggies and greens. Um, now, if someone's just starting out, you can definitely mix it with water if the taste is overwhelming. But I assure you that with all my pediatric patients that I put on this regimen of drinking freshly squeezed juice every morning, they're, they end up loving green juice within like a month, even the youngest kids who are super picky. And so if you must, you can always dilute it. Uh, dilute it is better than nothing, um, but definitely juicing in the morning. What is empty stomach? Well, 
I consider it an, um, uh, to take something on an empty stomach when you give it, when you drink it first thing in the morning and then wait about 20, 25 minutes before you eat. Um, or if you're juicing during the day, which is also great, give it about two to two and a half hours after your last meal to drink. This also works for adults. So, and actually all the recommendations are excellent for adults as well, but they're really, really, really safe for kids. Um, another way to increase glutathione, which is our body's, uh, one of the body's most prominent um, detox enzymes is to literally take it. Uh, now we could take it through food, which is the first way we wanna also always increase something. Glutathione rich foods are our cruciferous vegetables. Those are our kales, bok choys, um, Swiss chard, collard greens, watercress, broccoli, cauliflower. Um, there are also, there's also a ton of glutathione in mushrooms, garlic, onions, asparagus, and spinach. So basically all our greens and sometimes the greens that we don't love, but this gives us another reason to eat our veggies. We, we want to boost our body's ability to detox. That way we can reduce oxidative stress in our bodies and mop up all the free radicals and leave our immune systems to do what they're supposed to do, which is fight infections that shouldn't be there. Now, if you have a super, if you have a super, super busy week, and you, you really wanna kind of, or if you're fighting a cold and you really wanna boost the glutathione, you could also take it as a supplement. I don't typically recommend supplements as first line of defense against something, but it is available finally in a way that children will take it um, because it's usually pretty gross. <laughs> and so this is called liposomal glutathione and it's, it doesn't taste bad, it's easy to take. And it's a liquid that goes into the mouth. The next recommendation I have is a bit controversial, and I, I'm going to present it to you kind of with, let's keep this on the back of our minds a little bit, consider it if you totally disagree, but it's increasing vitamin D. And unless you've really not been paying attention, we have so many studies now, more than ever, that show how important vitamin D levels are to making sure that um, if a patient or a person or a child gets COVID, they don't end up in the intensive care unit. This is so important. There are so many studies that show this. Um, the numbers are um, really staggering. Um, the latest studies that I've been looking at um, reveal that about 88 to 96% of patients that were COVID positive that ended up in the ICU had very low vitamin D levels. So what can we do about that? How do we make sure that whatever virus or bacteria we're exposed to doesn't land us in a hospital, which is where I'm coming to you now and I'm telling you it is not that much fun. You wanna stay out of the hospital and if you're exposed to something, you wanna just be able to fight it really well. Vitamin D is key. There are many different ways to get vitamin D levels. First of all, if you're going in to see your doctor anyway, it's a good idea to get tested. It's a blood test. Um, so if, if you'd like to just go get a blood test, I think it's a good idea because if the numbers are really low, you could very easily give a bolus or a big boost of vitamin D and that's going to shoot up your vitamin D levels. But a more natural and holistic approach that's preventative and that I love is to get vitamin D naturally through sunshine. This is where people get really upset because we've been taught that sunshine is bad for us. We want to always wear sunscreen whenever we go out. And I'm here to tell you that there is an important, um, sunshine is not good for our bodies, not just good for our bodies to make vitamin D, but many other essential hormones. And so it's kind of like a nutrient for our bodies. And it's so important for melatonin production. So... Why, but melatonin is also really important for fighting infections. Melatonin is a hormone that's produced naturally in all people when they go to sleep. Melatonin only starts getting produced when we turn off all the lights. We also know that we need to have bright, natural light in the middle of the day in order for melatonin to stop being produced so it could start being produced at night when things are dim and low so that we can go to sleep. Melatonin is also really important in fighting viruses and colds, including COVID. So um, I literally prescribe sunshine to my young patients. They're 
we want to make sure that the sunshine is not burning. That's the key between having problems later on, like skin cancer, um, or or just getting the benefits of sunshine. We do not ever, ever want to burn. Um, now I'm coming to you from the Northeast, New York. It's fall season. Sunshine is slowly going away. It's going to be a pretty dark winter as always. So going out for about 20 minutes in the morning, like before 10 a.m. or even after 4 p.m. really, really, really prevents you from burning, but gives you the dose of sunshine that you need to make natural vitamin D. Now, if you are not able to do this, if you're living in a part of the country or the world that doesn't have a lot of sunshine, another way to naturally supplement vitamin D is cod liver oil. And although it kind of tastes fishy, fermented cod liver oil has the most perfect and natural ratio of vitamin D and vitamin A, making it the most absorbable and, and easy to use for your body. And so from vitamin D, kind of from the best is sunshine, the middle is cod liver oil, and if you must, you can use a regular old supplement of vitamin D. But in, in whatever, which way you use it, you need to use it. You need to make sure that your vitamin D levels are excellent. And the fifth and final way that I would like to recommend to you to boost your immune systems and for your whole family is to superpower your immune system by superpowering your gut flora and gut health. 88% of the immune system in the body is created and matured in the gut. Um, we know that in order to have a healthy immune system, we need to have a healthy gut. What can you do to naturally make sure that your gut health is top notch? And so my recommendation is something that is used in traditional medicine very often in traditional cultures always. And it's something that we've been forgetting about as a society. It's fermented foods. Fermented foods are a potent, safe, effective, holistic, and delicious way to make sure that we have a diverse and healthy microbiome in our guts. What is fermented food? It's things like kombucha, kefir, uh, sauerkraut, beet kvass is, a, is really yummy. Um, things like uh, kimchi or tempeh, yogurt or kefir. There are many different ways, water kefir. There are many, many, many different ways to make sure that we're eating fermented foods. Um, some studies show, and I firmly believe this, that there are more live uh, bacteria, the beneficial ones, in a teaspoon of a fermented, let's say fermented sauerkraut juice, than a lot of many different probiotics that you could be buying. And that's why I think the go-to is always fermented foods, and probiotics or supplements are kind of on like a background uh, choice. How much fermented food? As much as you can. There's really no maximum, but my recommendation, if you're new to this, is to start really slow because you're introducing new good bacteria into your gut, bad bacteria that shouldn't be there might start to die off, and you want to make that transition really, really smooth and seamless. And so I literally put my patients at Blossom Pediatrics who have a lot of chronic illness or are sick a lot or have a lot of um, repeat ear infections or getting strep throat all the time. One of my medications that I prescribe being a holistic pediatrician is fermented foods a certain amount of times each and every day to restore gut health, and thereby boosting the immune system in a really effective and natural healthy way. So those are the five tips that I have to boosting your immune system that are holistic, but also based in conventional medicine with lots of evidence behind them. Thanks, Nelly. That's great. And it's so exciting because it, it um, aligns so closely with what we do for our patients because Chinese medicine is really all about achieving balance in the body. And the fun thing about treating kids is that because they usually don't have complicated medical histories behind them, they're very easy to just sort of tip back into balance with very simple, um, relatively easy suggestions, such as, as you went through with your list of five. With us, the gut is absolutely first and foremost, we totally agree on that one. Um, fermented foods and um, probiotics are essential. And 
the one um, place where we differ a little bit, I would say, is the absorption of juices um, in the body. In Chinese medicine, we like warm stuff. So rather than juicing, we would say souping um, because we believe that the digestive fires need to work that much harder to warm stuff up to then break out the nutrients and um, enrich the body. So we like to give the digestive system a little bit of help by warming and cooking things a little bit before we ingest them. And soups usually go over pretty well with kids too. So, and it also avoids the um, heightened sugars that sometimes juicing can introduce. And that's one thing with Halloween coming on. And I saw there was a question in the chat about um, minimizing the effects of candy and sugar intake without restricting. I would say this time of year, this year in particular, restriction isn't a bad thing. Um, and if you're gonna have a little bit of treat at Halloween, which is always a fun thing to do, um, make sure that you are drinking a lot of water and eating your soups and, and ingesting some sort of fiber to get that sugar out of the system. Because we really don't want it sticking around and making things gummy and um, sticky for germs to come through. So uh, if you know that's on the schedule on October 31st, then prep with getting your kids to drink a lot of water, um, sometimes adding a little flavor, some berries or a little lemon or mint tea even helps them get it down, but just include increase fluids and, and so you're ready for that kind of additional sugar rush. Um, also, the vitamin D thing, I, I completely agree with. Uh, for parents, too, for sleep problems, often we find people taking melatonin and they miss the step of taking vitamin D first, which actually helps trigger that process. And so often we, we prescribe that to grown-ups as well as kids to, to help with sleep and immunity both. And especially in the canyons of New York City, it's really hard to get the amount of sunlight that we need. So any sort of boost that you can, can give on that score is great. Um, and I would add into it exercise in general um, with COVID and everybody being shut in, kids aren't running around the playground like they used to. And so, somehow incorporating movement and exercise is gonna be critical um, these next few months, I think, especially because a lot of kids are back online with school. Schools are doing a better job at incorporating movement in the lessons, but it's still something that's really lacking. Um, and with kids in front of TV, I think that was another question in the chat. Um, TV hurt liver chi. TV, sitting in for long periods of time, hurts all kinds of chi because we're just kind of there and nothing is moving and flowing the way it should. So if your kids like to be in front of screens, set timers, you know, get them up, get them doing a couple jumping jacks, and then they can go back if they want to. But ideally they're, they're moving their bodies in a good ratio to the amount that they're staring at a screen. Uh, the one thing um, that we didn't quite on touch on with Nelly, but I'm sure she'll agree. In this time of distancing, the physical touch of things is sort of lacking. And when you're a kid, that's just weird. And so ideas of touch and cuddles are really, really important to remember that to stimulate the nervous system and to kind of put it back in its box, that it's okay, you don't need to be all frazzled and frayed that a good hug is, is really important. And it's one of our major modalities in Chinese medicine when treating kids. We don't necessarily always treat with needles. Sometimes needles are a little you know, too worrisome for a small person. So we do a lot of pediatric massage. And we also um, use the tradition, a Japanese tradition of shonishin, which are little tools that you can see here that we use to stimulate the body and certain points on the body to um, help get the uh, immune system back on track. And certain things that parents can do if kids are feeling like they are kind of coming under the weather, also just purely preventative on a regular basis as they're going to bed. You can massage the inside of the palm, 
you can massage the soles of the feet. Both of those are filled with um, nervous uh, uh, nerve endings that will help stimulate general systems. And then one of my favorite and one every kid that I've ever um, treated is what's called pinching up the spine. And you start at the tailbone, the coccyx, and on either side of the spine, you just take that little bit of flesh that's there and you pinch all the way up to the neck. And that again is stimulating the nervous system to kind of get back and do its job properly. The kids think it's fabulous, it tickles, but then afterwards they loosen up and they ask for more. I've never had a kid not ask for more. Um, and it's just a really simple, easy way to get them to calm and soothe and get that energy flowing again that might be stuck after sitting in front of a computer all day or a TV for most of the day or just being stuck inside. So those are just a few quick, easy tips. And um, how hard are you pinching? <laughs> Not very hard. Uh, just a light kind of touch all the way up. And then you can smooth down with your hands and do it. And I like to repeat it nine times. It's a, it's a significant number in, in Chinese medicine. Some practitioners do it a hundred. Um, others just look until it raises a little bit of red along the spine. So pinching up and smoothing down. And I'm happy to continue with questions and yes. <laughs> add about sugar. Uh, yeah. So there we know uh, from a lot of studies that measure activity of the immune systems that eating sugar will literally depress the immune system for up to five hours um, with the most effect at three hours. And so I, uh, like, let's say you're traveling and you're at the airport and they give, there's, I don't know, candy equals airport or travel equals airport. And we tend to kind of eat on the run, but where we're most exposed, we want to really, really minimize the sugar intake or basically no sugar. Um, I'm not talking about natural sugar that's found in fruits and vegetables. I'm talking about the artificial stuff, um, added sugar, even, even like organic natural sugar cane or whatever it is that you think is the natural form, it will still depress the immune system quite a lot. Um, and then uh, there was a question about uh, cold raw juice if if it uh, if it's bad if it's damp. Um, I don't think that juice ever really needs to be cold. In fact, in the morning, I always recommend drinking um, room temperature or even warm water to wake up the digestive system to prep it before you drink juice. So um, I kind of should have mentioned that before, but I, I, I think that it really helps to wake up the digestive system by drinking not cold and not hot, but just like room temperature, regular water. Uh, sometimes it helps to add apple cider vinegar to it, just a tad or lemon, uh, because it will help with the digestive uh, enzymes in the stomach, preps it for its job digesting. This is all so amazing. Um, we did have one fun question come in about coughs um, and what to do if their child has a cough. So the question was, can I give my kid honey for their cough? And is there an age that is too young to start giving them honey? Uh, so honey is um, so, so good for us for so many reasons. For a cough, it is my go-to first uh, because I mean, it works. So I, I think it's important to suppress a cough if it's interfering with sleep because we need to sleep in order to heal properly. And so a lot of kids are up at night, like laying down and phlegm starts to build up in the back of the, of the nose and in the throat. And younger kids who are usually under like two years old, they are not able to blow their nose. And that's actually what lands them in the hospital very often. It's all those secretions building up. That's why honey not only um, goes into the places in the throat, in the back of the nose, the receptors that depress the cough reflex, but they thin out the secretions. That's why I think it's great. Conventional medicine says don't give honey to someone that's under 12 months of age. I've never seen anyone have a problem with honey. They say this because of botulism, basically. Um, if you're getting your honey from where, where is best, which is a local, um, uh, 
a, a local apiary where you know it's produced in a way that nothing else is added to it in a very humane way for the bees um i, I even then when it's kind of like batched in, a, in your neighbor's backyard i've never seen anyone have this problem with botulism but mo most practitioners american academy of pediatrics will say not under 12 months of age there are a lot of supplements um that they sell in, in in stores that are like natural holistic homeopathic that have honey in them but i think that there's nothing better than really high quality local organic honey that you could just get from a farmer's market or if you end up upstate somewhere in the country there's small honey men people who literally have beehives and they just have a ton of honey that's the best place to get it um local is important because it has the local flora and so it also helps your body understand what's happening to it because it's made of the things that you're exposed to every day so i'm not a big fan of having really super good for you honey shipped from new zealand or wherever else because we want what's around us to come into us as well and in, in, in the form of honey and in chinese medicine a really old uh tradition for coughs that are less productive and not quite so phlegmy um is cooked pears and kids usually are really you know into the pear in general um so pear juice pear, uh, raw pear but ideally cooked pears with a little bit of you know cinnamon and vanilla and um they go down real smooth and they help moisten and and let the cough become a little bit more productive the other thing that um no it does not have to be asian pears that's great if it is but um, pears in general i think generally work um and uh another thing that i often suggest and and you want to be careful with this in small children but for older children, having a humidifier that is very clean, you want to clean it regularly, um, with a couple drops of eucalyptus. And um, I really like thieves oil, which is a traditional blend. They call it different things depending on who the maker is. But the um, fundamental ingredient is clove among lemon and other things. And that helps with the fungal side of things and beating back molds. And oftentimes when colds linger, it's because it's actually a, a mold issue going on. And so that can be very effective as well. But only a couple drops, you don't want it overwhelming. You don't want to walk into the room and say, oh, it's flavorful. It just, a little bit of scent in the air is, is helpful, I find. Yeah, the, the fungal component is also what, when you have a child who has um, like a, tends to wheeze or have a lot of uh, lower airway inflammation or even diagnosed with asthma, those kids are super prone to f fungal mold and they end up having wheezing or asthma exacerbations on top of the viral illness. So I love that, that we could actually do something to keep the, the, um, the, fun the mold at bay. It's not good for anybody, really. Uh, <laughs> keep it at bay. Um, uh, but the humidifier being clean is so important. I mean, I think I left my humidifier with water in it for like a half a day, and it started to get moldy. Like that that, yeah, it, and that's why the thieves' oil is also good because it, it buys you a little more time. You still yeah. need to get at it, you know, but but it it does help a little bit delay that. Great, and we have one that I think um, is directly for you, Mary. Mm -hmm. I have gotten acupuncture pretty regularly for the last few months for a chronic problem. Do kids need to come for so long? That's a good question. Again, it goes to that idea that often kids respond very quickly. And so um, sometimes they have to come a, a couple times a week for a week or two. I mean, obviously it depends on, on what the issue is and, and how long they've had it, but we do see a quicker response usually. So um, maybe in the acute phase, they come a little more frequently and then they come for um, maintenance at sort of once a week, once every three weeks or so. But it, it depends on, on obviously the condition we're dealing with. The other nice thing about the pediatric massage is that we can teach mom and dad and family to do it at home too. So you're continuing your treatment um, while you're away from the office. We also um, prescribe herbs to kids too. And so that can help as well. Yeah, I, I agree. Kids are so much more resilient and, and they are able to reverse a lot of, so quickly, a lot of chronic childhood illnesses um, like 
what was what is considered to be really hard to reverse like uh, allergies or uh, eczema or asthma in adults, kids could turn around within a month and start having significant improvement in flares and symptoms and, and ultimately literally heal completely. And um, so kids are so amazing that way. <laughs> That, that usually takes a lot less to, um, to reverse these issues and to heal. And they just need some building blocks to heal sometimes. And, you know, the building blocks of healing is really what we're doing in holistic medicine. And it's habits that will last a long time, right, throughout life. If you, if you, if you can start them young, then they can carry it through. And it's, it's really kind of fun to see. I see that... Um, there was a question about cleaning, how you clean uh, a humidifier and whether you use bleach or not. I would recommend using uh, white vinegar. You don't want the sort of bits of bleach absorbed. So um, white vinegar is, is pretty effective. In fact, I, I agree with you completely, Mary, and I don't recommend using bleach or any um, artificial chemicals to clean the household for anyone especially children children are so much more vulnerable to toxins in their environment in our environment than than adults um so with things like cleaning products like bleach we think that we're doing a great thing by killing off all the germs and it is important to clean a humidifier but when you think about how much more exposure kids have just because they're breathing so much more so the same bleach that they're breathing in even if it's completely washed off it still smells like bleach that bleach is toxic and the body has to get rid of it and work really hard to do so and sometimes because there's so many toxins in our environment we can't get rid of the toxins fast enough in our bodies and so i i clean my whole entire house with vinegar actually and it does not smell when it dries at all and it's it's something that you can eat so if you're using something to clean the house you want to think about, can you ingest it? Or is it, is it okay to put on skin? Because if those two things are no, then don't put it on the skin and don't put it on any surfaces. Little kids are, think about it. Little kids are on the floor. They're climbing around the floor a lot more than adults, right? Um, kids also breathe a lot more per minute than an adult, meaning that they can be getting twice as much of the ingestion through breathing or through pollution as an adult. They're not fully developed and so the impact on their health is so much more than an adult plus they have a lot longer of a life ahead of them and again that's why the impact of having toxins in their environment is so much worse for them than for adults so if you have a house with kids clean the whole thing with bleach it's amazing you can put lemon in it it's going to smell amazing it's going to be clean sometimes i add baking soda if i want it to have like a scrubbing action Wonderful. And we got one more question about vitamins. Um, do you need to take vitamin K with vitamin D supplements? Um, sometimes it's sold that way. I don't think it's necessary. We're, we are able to get enough vitamin K produced um, on the regular. I do test a lot of children for vitamin deficiencies. And even kids who have a lot of chronic illnesses don't tend to need extra vitamin K. So I don't prescribe it that way because I want to minimize the amount of things that parents are buying and needing to give and take and it gets complicated. So um, it's just a bare bones. What can you get that you might not be getting from nature, from food currently in our environment? So I, I don't recommend uh, on the, on the, uh, on the nor normal amounts of giving vitamin K, but I can see that it could be something that is really helpful for adults. I, I agree with that. I, I don't think it's particularly necessary with kids. Nelly, can I ask you a question, um, your opinion about zinc? Zinc, uh, yes. Uh, I, I had five <laughs> things that I had to put down there. <laughs> And um, I left the zinc, I, I do take zinc when I work in like the ER, for example, yeah. with COVID patients because, um, or if I'm, feeling, if I'm feeling like I'm about to get sick, I do take zinc. Zinc is really hard for kids to take because it's disgusting. So the best form <laughs> of it, it just tastes like metal. Yeah. So very often it just doesn't work out. But if your kid is, if, I don't take it on the on the regular. I don't recommend taking it every day. But if you're feeling like you're running, coming down with something, zinc. But 
there are like six things that I take way before I even consider going to zinc actually. So zinc is, is up there, it does have its use. Once you're sick, you wanna, yes, it does help, but I tend to go to my herbs first, mm -hmm. um, like always, because they work for me. I even go to homeopathy before I, I go to zinc because zinc is kind of it'll it'll help boost something but it, it doesn't address like the root cause of something it doesn't give my body what it needs to fight infection as well as a lot of the herbs that i take um so i have my faves i um i usually i don't i, I usually like where i get my herbs i know how they're grown they're upstate new york they're local um i'm a big fan of echinacea i take a lot of mushrooms that are supportive for my immune system i think um for for children and adults, it's good to go natural first and then go to what's made in like a lab, which is zinc. Thanks. Thanks. I just got another question um, about the, well, not about, but in relation to the humidifiers. Can we use a warm vaporizer instead of a humidifier? I, and, and Nellie, it'd be good to hear your voice on this too. Um, I prefer the cool vapor just because it it's less of a breeding ground. Um, but that that's me. Yes, if you're able to keep your humidifier clean, um, there has been no evidence to show that one is better than the other. So it's a matter of preference. But it is a lot harder to keep the mold at bay in a room when you have warm humidity pumping through all the time. So I tend to keep it cool un unless it's just feeling too cold in the room and blast like some warm, but, but I keep it usually in a cool humidifier setting. Amazing. Um, and another question, is it okay to pick out gentle warriors on your own? So for those of you who don't know, gentle warriors is a, um, a line of pediatric herbal formulas that um, is uh, created to address certain conditions and also certain types of child. child. Um, in Chinese medicine, we view patterns of uh, conditions and, and we see the person as a whole and, and their combination of symptoms creates a, a type in our minds and that's how we diagnose. And so it it is designed to be fairly easy to use. I would still recommend checking with a practitioner before you give your child anything, just because sometimes uh, reading those types can be a little tricky. And often, most of us have some combination of the different types, and to see which one is predominant is kind of important when you're doing herbs. So I, I would check with a practitioner. Yeah, because herbs are so potent, they're not yeah. benign, and to get the most benefit, whichever direction you go with with herbs, and there's so many botanicals herbs, um, you want to work with someone that really knows the products because you want to maximize benefit and avoid risk. And a lot of herbs do have um, side effects. Um, they're not completely completely benign, so you always want to make sure that you're working with someone that knows what, what they're doing and I wouldn't recommend giving any supplements to any child unless speaking to a practitioner. That's amazing. Thank you guys for, for shedding light on that. Um, I think we have one more question and then we can start to wrap up. But if anybody else has anything urgent that they'd like to ask, we can do it right now. Um, so the last question that we have Another parent with similar problems told me that my kids' allergies and asthma may be related to their eczema. Is that possible? Uh, th thank you for asking. This is a very important topic because there's literally and unfortunately an epidemic of chronic childhood illness in America that is eczema, asthma, and allergies. One will ultimately lead to the other if we don't reverse the root cause of these problems. A lot of conventional practitioners, like your, the most fantastic pulmonologist, lung doctor, the most fantastic dermatologist, skin doctor for eczema, the most fantastic allergist that will tell you exactly what your kid is allergic to, will um, tell you that the reason why your kid is having this problem is solely because of genetics. This is actually not 
fully true because we know for about 20 years now that there's epigenetics involved, meaning the environment will influence genetics. And so if you don't address the environment that caused this problem in the first place, very often your child will now not outgrow it because now there's more adults having eczema, asthma, and allergies than children in most cases. And you're kind of disempowered as a parent because you're not, um, you're not doing anything to change the environment. Avoiding something like avoiding your allergy or something that causes eczema is not a solution. It's a band-aid, and it's not something that will work long term because whatever problem caused this in the first place will turn into other inflammatory atopic illnesses. These three things are called the atopic triad. So actually, you're absolutely right. They are absolutely related. They even have their own name. So what can you do as a parent to make sure that your child is not going to turn into an adult with eczema, asthma, or allergies. Well, you have to change their environment. And for many, many kids, what that means is addressing the root cause. And the root cause very often in most children is gut health. And if you start to reverse the foundation of this problem, which is actually so easy to do in kids, you will reverse asthma, eczema, and allergies completely. But if you go to, go to like a regular physician, they'll just give you steroids to calm the inflammation locally. This is actually something that will work, but it's not going to stop it from happening a week from now, a month from now, getting worse and transitioning from asthma and eczema to allergies and vice versa. So that's actually what my practice specializes in. Um, it's asthma, eczema, and allergy reversal. And not because I think those are things that I like love to do. It's because everyone is coming in with this problem. And it's kind of a pet peeve because when I ask parents like, well, what is your child on? And they say, and they say, oh, well, um, you know, they're on this medication, that medication, and then they don't even consider the Claritin, Zyrtec, or the allergy medicine, the steroids that they're given intranasally, the Flonase, to stop the allergy symptoms, then it's not even considered a medication anymore. So, <laughs> so uh, I really urge you, if you have a kid who has any one of these conditions, or not even, even if they're not diagnosed, but tend to wheeze, or have rashes, or have seasonal allergies, that's something that needs to have a a specialist diagnose it, consider starting to reverse the root cause, which is usually gut health. Yeah, and, and in Chinese medicine, actually, those are all interconnected because the lung, the skin, and the gut are all considered filters, right, of, of outside materials coming into the body and how our body can figure out what's the good stuff and what's the bad stuff. And so they share that job together. And if one is acting, off, then all of them will show signs of, of uh, inflammation and, and crisis. So we like to treat them as a batch. Amazing. And we just had one come through. Uh, this is a great one. A woman asked me if I thought my son was getting sick all of the time because he was vaccinated. He had just started daycare and was getting all of the germs. Are there herbal slash natural ways to support the body before and after vaccinations? Absolutely, yeah. Um, there's different, I mean, everyone's needs are different, so it's hard to kind of put an umbrella term to it, but there are so many things you as a parent can do, or even for yourself, uh, to decrease the negative side effects and minimize the damage that vaccinations could cause for some kids. So for some children, that might mean, um, detox baths which if your child is already taking a bath throwing a scoop of bentonite clay or epsom salt to literally help the body detox in everyday life will help tremendously there is a wide range of homeopathic modalities that are used preventively and um, well preventatively the day of the vaccine and after the vaccine depending on what the child's age and needs a vaccine is to help reduce the negative side effects of vaccine for some kids that could mean just having a fever or being irritable for other kids that could mean a lot lot more and it could be really complicated and something that lingers for years and so there is so much we can do as parents to avoid that And as Nellie, Nellie and I were discussing earlier, the idea of scheduling vaccines at a sort of broader 
pace is also something to consider as well. But, and it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning for any kind of immune health that the idea of uh, making sure their diet is clean, making sure they're in drinking water. I'm, I'm really boring when it comes to water. It's sort of my main line for everything. All my patients get annoyed, but it's true. Drink water um, and get the fluids going. That's the, our best way of detox, right? And um, making sure there's fiber in the diet also to carry out the detox. And massage, massage is gonna help too. That's perfect. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to talk with us and to answer all of our questions. Um, if anybody wants to get in contact with you, what would be the best way that they could do that? Um, so I, my practice is in New York City. It's blossompediatrics.com. I also do uh, telemedicine visits and I offer a 30-day rescue your child program that's intended to literally reverse the many, many different chronic childhood illnesses, including eczema, asthma, and allergies uh, that we see in a, in a natural, holistic way. And that's for, if you're outside of New York, that's a, a great place to start, uh, where I teach families live every single week on what exactly steps they need to take to reverse their kids' illnesses uh, permanently. So that info can be found on blossompediatrics.com. And we're also based in New York. We have two clinics in Manhattan, one on 17th Street, one on 53rd on the east side, um, and then one in Brooklyn Heights. And we are at yanova.com. Um, and I am M. Hamawi at yanova.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, to everyone that's here. We're just going to, we'll send out a recap email with everything that we talked about, and we'll attach the recording so you guys can watch anytime you need. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. It was a blast. It was fun. Yeah, Thanks, this is Nellie. so fun. Yeah.